Thank you for listening to The Mentor Project, where we discuss marketing, SEO, how to go full-time in your business, and so much more. Here's your host, Nicole Bruce. Hey guys, it's Nicole here with a special guest. While scrolling through Instagram and trying to find new photographers to follow that did what I wanted to do, travel and photography, I I found influencer Victoria Bonvicini. She's going to be on the show today talking about what she does and why traveling for work isn't always rainbows and unicorns, and it's definitely not easy or always pleasurable. Victoria, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, girl. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be doing this. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you too. So let's go ahead and get started and just go ahead and tell us a little bit about you and your brand. Yeah, totally. So I am a full-time destination wedding photographer for couples, mainly and only I shoot weddings and engagement sessions Majority of them are abroad or just completely out of my state. Um, I have branded myself like that for the past uh, four years. It was kind of hard transition, but finally now um, I get to travel 100% to photograph couples. Yeah, that's awesome. So do you take any work actually within the state? Um, hardly ever. Sometimes, uh, some of my couples that like contact me last minute or along like Instagram and all of that, they find me, they just realize like sometimes they think actually that I live in Los Angeles or that I live in New York. And when it's time to book, they ended up telling me, oh, actually I'm getting married in Nashville. And I was like, oh, funny, I happen to live in Nashville. (laughs) So um, I do get a lot of sometimes elopements in Nashville, and it's usually from people that live in other states. But I would say that the amount of weddings that I get to do where I live, it's like two or three per year. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. I do pretty much the same thing right now is I I try and avoid the local stuff. Yeah. Um, Just because, you know, like we already know where we live. (laughs) Um, So it's fun to explore other places. Um, So Mm -hmm. I know we were talking on Instagram and you agreed to be on the podcast, which was so exciting. And then I asked you what you wanted to talk about and you wanted to talk about how travel wasn't always what it appeared to be, especially on social media. So what kind of led you to wanting to talk about that more? I feel like uh, while on Instagram, like a lot of people will contact me and they would just say, hey, oh my gosh, I love what you do. I would love to do that. Like that is my passion. I want to travel and see the world and shoot couples. Your life is so amazing. This is so incredible. You're so lucky. And I am, I'm very uh, definitely lucky and blessed for being able to do that for a living. But I just wanted people to not think that everything is just perfect or that everything is wonderful all the time. Being a destination photographer is one expensive uh, And I see a lot of people that are starting into trying to brand themselves as destination photographers, just putting their price so low, you know, just to get that going, which at some point I feel like it is okay if you're just starting, but I feel like people sometimes are paying more from their own pocket just to pursue that. And, you know, they just kind of dig their own, like themselves into this hole that they just cannot come out of it. And um, I just feel like I would love to share more of how it's not always perfect, how it requires time, it requires a lot of effort, and also it requires just in general a lot of patience, you know, because traveling abroad, it's not always easy Um, so I felt like that would be, you know, one of the best things. That's what I know the most. And I just would love to be able to share that side with everyone. Yeah, definitely. So I think to kind of start things off, um, let's talk about obviously the first part that would entail traveling and that's kind of planning your trip out and figuring out 
you know, what plane tickets you need to buy or what train tickets, depending on what part of the world, um, coordinating hotels and rental cars and all of that fun stuff. Uh, I know for me, that is honestly like one of the worst parts. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> We recently went to Europe and we had not gone um, to that part of the world before. And Mm -hmm. so we also weren't familiar with cities. We've always lived kind of in the country or in smaller cities. So when we went over there, you know, we had uh, the metros to Mm -hmm. get used to. And once we got used to them, it was awesome. But the first day or two we were so lost. (laughs) We had no idea what to do. And I'm pretty sure all the locals were making fun of us. But (laughs) as far as planning your trip goes, talk a little bit about struggles you even have when you're kind of trying to map everything out and make everything perfect. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. I agree with you. That is one of the most like frustrating parts when it comes to traveling because the, the, fun part is booking a client that wants you to first off wants to pay for your traveling you know to go abroad and then you're like oh my gosh this is the best and you know we all wish they all did all the part and we just showed up but that is not the reality we have to do that Mm -hmm. um for me personally i have my own system um which as soon as a client books me uh my first thing is to just start tracking flights. Usually when they book me abroad, they don't um, get to like, I mean, their wedding is not like right around the corner. We have some time, I would say we have between like eight to like 14 months, depending on, you know, when they're getting married. So my first step is definitely to start tracking flights. So I just set up uh, um, on Google flights, um, like a setting up schedule for like a range of dates where I think would be the most ideal to fly in and to fly out based on when they're getting married. Mm -hmm. Um, And then from that moment on, I just start realizing what is the best like route to get there. So for instance, I am heading the next like three months abroad um, as I am shooting um, a few weddings out there and one of the hot, like one of the weddings that's happening right in the middle of my trip is in uh, Florence and based out of Nashville, like for this part of the year, it's just difficult to fly from Nashville to Florence because it is a very expensive flight. Mm-hmm. Um, so my next step is just to figure out how, like, where can I fly from? And where can I fly into closer to Italy that would be cost like effective into my trip and probably add other places around. Um, So it is just a lot of mapping and a lot of figuring out, I guess, what is the best way to just save money into airfare because airfare is going to be one of the most expensive things for sure in this trip um and then once i have that figure out because like for me especially i like to fly usually new york to london it's always one of the most affordable like ways to do Mm -hmm. and um nashville to new york is very affordable always like that i can cover with points and then flying from new york to london it is like uh, $400 sometimes and then I have a couple of couples in London as well so I could set up their engagement session perfectly within that time and already just kill those sessions there and then from London to Italy for instance it was only like $120 like Mm -hmm. round trip so in the end of the day a ticket that was going to cost me $1,800 ended up costing me only like $520 uh which is great so i guess like just mapping yourself and just being willing to spend time in airport just being willing to um go from point a to point b to get to c uh is one of the main things that i feel like people forget because a lot of people are just like okay i don't want to sit in an airplane for like uh, 
20 hours. <laughs> None yeah. of us really want, but do you want to pay $2,800 for an airfare when they only paid you $2,500 to get there, including your hotel, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and then the second part is definitely a place to stay. I like to always check, uh, um, the most uh, like connected area when it comes to public transportation because if i am in those places i am not going to rent a car or i'm not going to depend on uber so if i am staying in any place in europe that i know where they use a lot of public transportation i try to get very central right and a lot of people yes it is like fantastic but a lot of people will say oh my gosh i don't want to stay where it's super touristic which is usually central. I feel like central is super touristic. And I'm like, well, you don't have to do all the touristic stuff, which I'm like, it's so much fun. Do it anyways. Mm -hmm. But you can just stay central because that's where all the public transportation is. And then you can just from there easily access other places. So based on that, I would try to find either Airbnbs or, you know, hotels that are very affordable, you know, central areas, uh, which comes to a fantastic total price of just traveling um, for like a really great price. Uh, But People just need to figure out that if you're going to work, sometimes, you know, you just have to kind of weigh yourself in a balance of what do you want to do and how much do you want to spend on this? You know, I would love to stay in a five-star hotel every single day of my life, uh, (laughs) you know, in Cambridge and being doing amazing things. But the truth is, I am not there for that. I'd rather spend my money into like uh, train rides and, you know, country hopping which is so affordable in Europe and seeing five countries in one time instead of just spending all my money in hotels and, you know, Ubers and only getting stuck in the downtown London. So it's yeah, a give or take. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's something that when people think of like, oh, you're traveling for photography, that's so fun. Like they imagine us going and doing like all those tourist things and like staying in five star hotels yeah. and you know like having someone just like chauffeur you around and it just seems like it's it's put out to be so glamorous but in reality you're like okay i can only spend like 50 dollars today <laughs> like let's eat at a gas exactly. station <laughs> and then let's go eat some like grocery <laughs> store food <laughs> Exactly. Yes, it is. Um, and I mean, I I fully believe that there are other photographers out there that also do destination that they are they are definitely mm-hmm. living that high life. You know, um, it is all about what people want and what people take from it. Um, I am all about like country hopping. So if I am going to shoot one wedding in Europe, uh, you know, and they have paid me like this X amount of money. And all my bills have been paid and I can like use all that money basically just for my trip. I am the kind of person that I rather save on just eating out into fancy restaurants yeah. abroad every single day, you know, or staying in a five-star hotel or going first class or going direct to flight from a you know, a city that basically does not support international mm-hmm. flight like Nashville. You know, like I rather just hop from New York to London, which it would make much more like sense in my pocket and spend all the rest of that money literally just, you know, going to like five more other countries around the place that I'm going just because it is more my style. It is more experience. Plus, you can just meet other couples in these other countries and photograph them and come back with a portfolio of shooting other couples in like five different countries instead of having just that one couple that you went to shoot in Europe, you know, like just as an example. So I do feel like that some people love that idea, but in the end of the day, we are just, you know, grocery shopping around the block and cooking, you know, inside our Airbnb so we don't have to spend all that money out there. Um, so we can spend that money in a thousand other yeah, better definitely. ways, you know. So um, now that we, you know, are talking about getting our 
our trip planned and everything, once we have everything laid out, I'm sure some people have had situations where flights have just not gone right, <laughs> where things have gotten canceled or yeah, there's been anything. storms. Um, but yeah. for especially for international travel or if you're using different airlines to connect to get a cheaper deal, when a flight cancels, it can mm-hmm. literally like ruin your trip. <laughs> Exactly. It can. Uh, I know one time we were just flying up to Maine. So it was from Nashville to Maine. And that's not even that Mm -hmm. far. Uh, But (laughs) we connected in New York and there were storms going on and our flight ended up being canceled four times. And then (laughs) we got stuck overnight in New York and they didn't pay for it because it was weather canceled. Um, yes. so we grabbed a hotel and it was $250 for like the lowest tier hotel you could possibly get. And it, you know, it was just traveling and flying for two days straight. And when we left in the morning, our taxi ended up hitting someone, uh, in their <laughs> car <laughs> and then oh, God. we got to the airport and they were like, Oh, you're at the wrong airport. <laughs> so oh, it was once your flight plans kind of go down the drain. They seem to just really, really go down the drain. (laughs) So what is one of your worst traveling stories in terms of where just things just didn't go right? Yes. Um, It is. Yeah. It's just like I said, it is so funny because everybody, like one of the things that somebody, Oh, what's your, like best advice when it comes like let's say for like traveling abroad I'm like well it is always a give or take so just be prepared for whatever comes Mm -hmm. ahead so um one time I had a wedding happening uh well it was an elopement happening in Iceland and I was like oh that is awesome I am gonna just take advantage you know of heading to Iceland but I'm going to just also take advantage and head somewhere else because I am right there, yeah. you know? So um, I ended up landing in Iceland and it was very cold and they were getting some storms because we chose just actually an awful time of the year to ended up doing an elopement in Iceland because it was absolutely like that winter. <laughs> it was beautiful, but Iceland... I mean, it is already the land of ice and we are talking about that basically in the summer. It's cold no matter what, but then when you go in the winter, it is like awfully cold. It's just so, so terrible. But um, I was like, that's going to be great. Let's brave it. It's going to be beautiful. So I ended up doing that and I am, you know, in my brain, I'm like, okay, it's freaking Iceland. They're used to like winter. They're used to, you know, landing into all of that because that's what they have uh, majority of the year. So I landed in Iceland and from Iceland, I wanted to go to uh, Bristol in the UK. So I was like, I'm going to just take a flight from Iceland to, you know, London. And then from there, I'm going to make to Bristol. But my flight returning home was still from Iceland. And then I was like, okay, so I'm going to just go to London uh, area airport. And then I'm going to go back from London to Iceland. From Iceland, I'm going to fly back home. So made it to London. It was totally fine. Made it back to Iceland. It was totally fine. And I'm thinking, okay, if something is going to go down, it's going to be right here. (laughs) And I had a wedding happening in Atlanta, Georgia. I think it was in a, around like January 20th. I can't remember the date, but it was like end of January and I was, I said, okay, I'm going to return from Iceland to Atlanta around like January 10th. I was like, that's going to be perfect. I have plenty of time. I can even go home to Nashville and then just kind of come back. But my fly to Iceland was living from Atlanta because mm-hmm. it was cheaper. So my car was in Atlanta. Everything was in Atlanta waiting for me. Um, I get at the airport in Iceland and basically they have shut down everything because all flights flying from like anywhere into Iceland was just like a nightmare. They couldn't see. It was like super gloomy because it was like 
so winter and so thick the air, the, the airplanes just couldn't land. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. I still have some time here. So I just got, again, spend money, you get a hotel because, you know, that's what you have to do and ended up getting a hotel and hotels in Iceland are extremely expensive Mm -hmm. and two, they're extremely far from everything. So got a hotel and they're like, okay, call us tomorrow and we can tell you. So tomorrow I woke up, called them and they're like, well, still you can't leave Iceland. And I was like, another day in Iceland. So that kept going for about like four days. I had added four days of this really expensive hotel in Iceland. And it was just like one of the th- those things that you have to keep checking on. So like you can't just like, okay, here I am. Maybe by this day it's going to work. You just have to keep calling and checking. And then you have to keep going down to the front desk and say, okay, I am actually going to stay another extra day. So for the fourth day, they just said, there is no way the air is so thick. We cannot manage to fly like that high. And I was like, okay, I need to get out of here because I have to be, you know, at this place at this time. They're like, well, from Iceland, you're not going to get any like big flights. And then she was like, but you could fly to like back to London. You can fly to London because it's a short flight. And we're going to fly low. And from London, you can probably figure out a way of going back oh home. God. And I was like, okay, I have absolutely no other option because basically the flight from Iceland to from Reykjavik to London, it's like $80. Mm-hmm. So it, is, it was being way cheaper than just literally paying... I think I was paying 230 close to like 250 was like $228 per night for this random hotel that again it was yeah. not good you know so I flew to London uh and it was the scariest flight ever because they had to fly super low because of the air I mean it was just terrifying landing in London and then from London, I am trying to figure out flights. So everything is expensive. My only option that was very affordable was to fly to San Francisco. Oh my God. <laughs> like really opposite. I was like, look, I just need to get to America <laughs> and then I'll figure out. So I flew to San oh Francisco God. and bottom line, the fog in San Francisco, because it was that winter, it was causing for like flights to also get oh canceled God. so we were able to land but basically like a majority of the next flights were getting just canceled and I couldn't believe it's like I just can't believe that this is happening and by the time that this is happening I have literally two days to get to Atlanta oh my God. so a trip that I had I spare you know 10 days to make it to Atlanta turning to a trip that I have only two days to get to Atlanta. So from San Francisco, I rented a car, drove all the way to LAX. And from LAX, I ended up flying to Atlanta, straight to Atlanta, Georgia. And I got there the morning of the wedding. Oh my God. Yeah. So I shot the wedding, the entire wedding, literally like completely jet lagged from God knows how many days ago I have been trying to just get places. Um, So that was like, I mean, that was like the craziest story that I have to say. I just, and the most expensive, I I think like I have to like probably go way back in my bank statements to check, but it was a total of probably like Mm $1,500 extra on travel expenses just by trying to manage to get to one spot, you know? Um, And it was scary because I had so many days to spare. And it's crazy because, like, we just don't know what's going to happen along the way. Um, So I am always just telling people, just give you yourself time, but don't sit there sometimes Mm -hmm. and wait. You know, be proactive and ask, check the weather, realize, you know, what's going on around because – I, my only regret is that I should have probably asked more everyone in Iceland if that was going to change in the next couple yeah. of days, you know? 
because if they had told me that I could probably have just like realized at that point that was not going to change and, okay, and said, okay, I'm flying straight to London and from London, I'm going to figure mm-hmm. out something, you know, but no, I spent like four days in Iceland trying to leave and then all that money in a hotel, you know, and then I got to San Francisco and it was way too foggy flights getting canceled in San Francisco as well. So uh, all I have to say is just give yourself time, but be proactive about it. You know, figure out all your other ways, your exit ways out of that situation. Don't just wait stuck in one place because it might not happen. (laughs) That's literally the most (laughs) insane story I've ever heard. I think, (laughs) good Lord. I'm never doing that. Well, I'm doing that many other times, but not in that yeah. intensity. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Okay. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned towards the end of that story that was so unfortunate um, was jet lag and shooting the <laughs> wedding under jet lag. And I think, uh, especially myself, I had, you know, I've been to pretty much every U.S. state. And I've flown all over the place and and visited all of the states. And every time that I've flown into a different state, I really don't have jet lag that much. Um, But like I said, this past spring, we went to Europe. And I was like, oh, I got this. I don't even get jet lag. I'm fine. So (laughs) I went (laughs) and I was pretty okay while I was there. But when I came back to America, the jet lag was so bad. (laughs) Like I literally went to the doctor and was like, I think I'm dying right now. And they were like, (laughs) okay, well, we'll check everything. And everything of course came out clear and I just looked like an idiot, but I was like, I'm dying right now. Like you guys need to like do something. So I think my biggest question here is, especially when you're flying out internationally for these weddings, how many days do you actually give yourself round trip? Well, honestly, it all depends on what flight I'm choosing also to like buy, like if it's a morning flight or a night flight. Usually for like uh, international flights, I like to arrive, uh, um, I would say like four to like uh, five days before Mm -hmm. the wedding. Not only because of the jet lag, but also because, you know, I need to figure out my way around. You know, like, uh, for instance, like I'm, one of the examples that I like to use is I feel like traveling Europe, you know, we have uh, the public transportation of that. But like if you go to Mexico, for instance, uh, public transportation is not an option. So your option is either to rent or get mm-hmm. a car service uh, and just kind of moving around is difficult. So I would include into also like the jet lag and also the. Uh, the time to move around, definitely like time to just figure out how you get to places. But just getting back to jet lag, I would say for international, I like to give myself like five days before the wedding. And then I would say if I'm flying back home and I have another job between that job and flying back home, I like to give myself at least like two to three days. Um, and there are ways that I use to try to avoid your life. Cause like, for instance, that wedding that I shot in Atlanta, but I had to go Iceland, London, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Atlanta. Um, I was, I mean, I was experiencing a million <laughs> jet lags cause we we're talking about West coast time. We we're talking about Europe, Europe time. And then we we're talking about Atlanta, which is a, also an hour different from Nashville. It's just like one mm-hmm. jet lag on top of the other. Um, I, uh, that scenario kind of went like off the rail a little, but I like to just fly anywhere I'm flying in, in the morning. So like, I like to fly overnight and get there in the morning and as tired as I am. And, you know, as much as I want to just rest a little bit before I go out to explore, I force myself to just stay Mm -hmm. wide awake and get myself as much tired as I can. So I just usually choose to land pretty early, like around 6 a.m., 10 a.m. in another country. And then that is the hardest part when you're going somewhere, like your jet lag is just completely the opposite of that. Um, And then all I do is just to 
get myself an energy drink and try to find my body against what's going on. And I go and I just walk around. I just go see places. I visit museums. I go everywhere. I do basically all the touristic thing because that tires you emotionally <laughs> and mentally so much. Yeah. And when it's around like nine of where, wherever I am, it's time to like hit the bed. And then I feel like next day when I wake up, it's like I was born and raised wherever <laughs> I am. Um, I feel like that is my way of just like fighting <laughs> back the jet lag. Now, I, I have flown places where I landed around like 4 p.m. And that is a no-no because you're trying to catch up and you never catch yeah, up. It's yeah. terrifying. <laughs> I know like I've looked on um, especially photographers that – travel internationally a lot for weddings and stuff like that that they have kind of like a minimum day even on their website like for clients to see do you include like a minimum day that Mm -hmm. you know like you have to be in that country for like five days or seven days do you include that in your packages as well so no so the way that I uh include in my packages Mm -hmm. is just a travel fee and I like my couples usually like they don't care as long as I am there, you know, as as long as I show up because it's just like a wedding day, you know, like a, a wedding day anywhere. Like if I'm going to shoot a wedding day in New York. My couples kind of don't have the power of telling me you have to be there, you know, the day before. I'm like, I don't have to be the, the, there the day before because your wedding is on Saturday. I have to be there on Saturday. You know, like it doesn't matter how I'm going to get there on Saturday or how far before. So I have kind of this agreement on my packages where they kind of don't have the right to choose when I go and when I leave and from where I live because they don't choose. um, They don't choose like my airfare or, you know, from where I'm flying. So I always guarantee them, especially for international, that I will be there like a couple of days before their wedding, obviously also for their mind's sake, because I know how terrifying they can, they can just like piece together. What if she miss her flight? What if this, what if that, you know, but for my sake, I will give myself like a few days. So I tend to give myself like myself, like five days before a wedding day for international, like, um, weddings again because I just need to figure out my way around I need to figure out you know where exactly is this venue especially if it's internationally I like to get to go to the venue like not that I'm gonna walk inside the venue but I like to see how I get to the venue with public transportation so I just do the entire routine I usually take one day where let's say if I have to be at the wedding at 11 30 a.m I will just wake up, do my routine and leave by eight. Like if that's the time I think it's going to get me that at that place, you know, by the right time, I'll leave at eight and I'm going to hop on the bus, hop in the metro and just walk all the blocks I have to walk. And then once I get in front of the where the wedding is happening, I look at my, you know, watch and I was like, okay, that was perfect timing. Or, okay, maybe I should give myself an extra like, 30 minutes here and there. Um, so I like to give myself that, but um, my couple, since they pay the travel fee, they really don't know, or they really don't have how to choose when I'm going to get there or how I'm going to get there. Because sometimes if I am gathering you know, trips, I can fly from anywhere. If I'm shooting a wedding in the West, I probably will fly from West somewhere else instead of flying from yeah. Nashville somewhere else. So um, I would say that I I would give myself like five days for an international trip. <laughs> okay, perfect. So this next one that we're talking about is actually one that I just discovered while I went out of the country last month, and I didn't even know it was a thing, to be honest, which probably sounds really stupid, Um, (laughs) but you can actually, when you're traveling, uh, obviously each environment, each country has different bacteria, different things that Mm -hmm. we aren't necessarily used to in the U.S., 
And especially when it comes to food and water, obviously, um, well, not even obviously, always make sure that the water is drinkable where you're at. Yes. And um, because sometimes it's not and you can only use water bottles the whole time. So that's really important. But sometimes even the way the food is prepared and stuff like that is just a little bit different than what we're used to. Um, You know, maybe the pesticides are different. Just everything's a little bit different. So there's different bacteria, different places. And last month, um, I went to Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic Uh for a wedding. It, It was all good until maybe like three or four days in and my stomach started hurting And it just, Mm -hmm. it didn't ever go away. It was there for like a week. Having exposure to different bacteria in different countries is a thing. And you are bound to sometimes catch something when you're traveling too. Yes. Which I don't think people realize because, you know, you're taking all these pretty pictures. Yeah. But sometimes behind the scenes, you're like holding your stomach (laughs) or having a migraine or you know, whatever. So getting sick on your travels is definitely a thing. And I think that's kind of one of the parts that Instagram kind of hides behind the scenes and it doesn't really show that part. Exactly. Yes. Like definitely that is like, there's, there needs to be like a lot of prepping also for going abroad because it is not all perfect. Just like you said, like um, especially going to a country where is a third world country, you know, uh, mm-hmm. everything changed. Plus, uh, we are so used to, um, to America where everything is pretty organized and very fantastic, you know. But once you get out there, you realize that things are a little bit more chaotic than expected. And mm-hmm. majority of places that we get to, like, let's say, oh, my gosh, I want to go to, I don't know. Let's say I want to go to Greece. You know, we look in the internet and we see all these beautiful photos and everyone's smiling and just looking fab. But when you get there, you know, yes, you can also look fabulous, you know, in that corner of Greece, but you just have to make it there, you know, and to make it there, you have to get into this buzz. You have to go through this weird neighborhood. You have to go here, have to touch this, have to touch that. So, uh, yes, definitely, uh, as you said, water. Make sure it is drinkable. I particularly don't trust um, some places, even if, it, you know, I ask at the hotel, like I ask at the front desk, hey, is this drinkable? They will say yes. I am still buying water bottles, you know, because <laughs> I'm like, mm, I don't need to get a bug virus, like, you know, or a stomach something here right now because, yeah this is not going to go well with traveling abroad. Um, But I feel like, for instance, I drink a lot. I take a lot of vitamin C's with me, uh, take a lot of Advil or whatever medication you take. And as you are there, also like uh, be aware of always washing your hands. It sounds so silly, but we are just involved into so many different things going on in our air you know it Mm -hmm. it, it's just crazy I am born and raised in Brazil and talk about third world country that has a bunch of stuff going on that we don't even know you know like and I, I I've been in America for only like eight years now you know so I span basically 20 years of my life in Brazil and you know we have so many different mosquitoes that bring this amount of like sickness and all that and it's just like uh, one of those things that I feel like when people are going to Brazil for instance they just don't know that so always do some research you know do you need a shot to go to this country Mm -hmm. you know do you need to get vaccinated by you know for something do you need to be aware of something you know, do you need to be looking for this type of bug bite on your body? You know, like, yeah. uh, should I not be getting into that lake because that lake has this type of thing in it? You know, just do yeah. some basic research of like how not to get sick into those places. You know, drink a lot of water, obviously, and eat, you know, a lot of vegetables and fruits, like especially if you're in Europe, 
vegetables and fruits are so fantastic there just keep giving yourself all the vitamin you can take because eventually your body will get acclimate to the area and then you're mm-hmm. like good to go but until then don't just land and think this is great you know and just go for it because <laughs> you don't want to get sick you know you don't want to just like have to spend basically like the fantastic time abroad in bed or in a international hospital <laughs> yeah no <laughs> that would nope. be terrible, be terrible um, yeah. <laughs> so as we're kind of getting to the end of the episode i should ask you a few more questions that our listeners might be thinking so what is your advice for charging what you're worth mm. my advice is it is hard because I have been a part of the culture where I thought that charging less and working way more, it was going to benefit me, you -hmm. know, and I have been one of those photographers saying, oh my gosh, yes, let me shoot this for free, you know, in exchange of this. I I have been a part of that and um, I have learned from that. Um... So I would love to just, you know, I guess give the advice to people that that in order to charge what you're worth, you first off need to sit down and genuinely put on a paper the cost of your business. Mm -hmm. It is the most boring thing in the world, but it is necessary. You know, how much it costs to upload a gallery to your website, how much it costs your phone bill because you're using for your work, how much this is, you know, literally make a list and then divide that by, you know, how much does it cost monthly to keep up with your Mm -hmm, business? And then from that, sit down with yourself and with your schedule and just realize how much do I want to work based on my life? Because we all want to make money. We all want to just make the big bucks. But the truth is, can we handle, you know, can we handle shooting 65 weddings a year added all those weddings, having to deal with all those brides, which they're lovely, but, you know, they will ask you so many questions through emails, you know, throughout the closer you get to the date. And it's totally normal. It's a part of what we do. But are you okay to handle with, let's say, if each bride sends you five emails, five times 65 weddings, you know, we're talking about you know, so many little details. So if in the end of the road, you realize, okay, I would like to do one wedding per weekend. I feel like I can handle that. I can deliver these galleries within the right amount of time that I need to add it. I can deliver a fantastic job for weddings. Okay. So divide that money, you know, per those four weddings and then add more. Don't forget to add taxes to yes. it, you know, and add a little more, add the service that you're providing, you know, add the quality of the service in your time. Because as self-employed, sometimes we forget to add the value of our time, our yep. downtime, you know, but downtime is literally, downtime is literally sitting in front of a computer for 14 hours every day, yeah. you know, and that is not fun all <laughs> the time. So I would say that always make sure that, you are being fair to yourself, you know, and it's scary when you put all this down, you might realize that you're worth $5,500 for a wedding, you know, and you're like, dang, that's a lot. But if you are worth $5,500 because of the service that you offer, the way that you offer and the packages that you offer, don't be scared because you want to get those clients that pay you $5,500, Absolutely, you know? So my advice is just mainly sitting down, putting on a paper, you know, tracing step by step of what costs you to keep up with your business and, you know, how much do you need to pay yourself back for that? And from that moment on, know your value, know your time and and balance yourself off other other things. I remember one time sitting down and asking one of my friends that's very successful on a regular nine to five. But it's not an uh, like a crazy job. Like she works for a company doing, you know, administrating stuff. And I asked her, I was like, okay, do you mind if I, she's like a very close friend. I was like, do you mind if I ask how much you make per year? 
And she said, yes. I was like, okay, that is fair. I like that. I was like, do you, now I'm going to, how many hours do you work per week? And then, you know, we calculate that. And I just balanced what I make to what you made, what she, she made. And I was like, okay, basically I'm charging exactly the nine to five. And I was like, the thing is, I, I didn't choose the nine to five right. life, you know, so I shouldn't be getting paid as a nine to five life. You know, I should be probably like adding more to this. So that completely changed in my game when I got to put myself against, you know, other things. Cause I am definitely not working nine to five. I'm working six to midnight, Monday to Monday, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, cause yeah. it never ends. So I would say just always balance yourself and put numbers down on the paper and realize the real numbers. Don't just toss a number, put a number out there because it's going to make so much more sense when you send your price guide to someone. You're going to feel so proud of yourself for being charging that because now it makes sense because you know why. Yeah, definitely. And I love the way you put that. Like we are not working a nine to five. Uh, if it was that easy, then yeah, we can charge a little bit less, <laughs> but it's not that easy. We're always exactly. working. A lot of us run our business at least somewhat through like social media or email, which is connected to our personal phones too. So it's not yes. like we have a getaway from it either. You know, if a text pops up from a bride, you're going to answer it. What we've talked about before is time blocking and, and realizing what time of the week is yours and what time it's okay not to reply to people right away. So exactly. I feel like it's appropriate since I found you on Instagram to ask you if you have any Instagram advice for us. If, uh, you know, anybody has the goal of the, or like the idea of getting into destination weddings, uh, Instagram is your best mm -hmm. friend. Uh, it, it is a sad reality sometimes just because with the new numbers it has messed up so many of us yeah. and all of that so for instagram the advice that i have is just keep being true to yourself and keep posting and my okay i do have actually a great <laughs> advice <laughs> because this advice was given to me by jordan voth and he is the king of all like he's my greatest inspiration into wedding photography he's the reason why i do weddings actually and one time i was like jordan i am not getting destination weddings i want to do what you do you know i want to get the dream clients i want to travel to shoe weddings and that was so many years ago and jordan just looked at me and he said what are you posting on your instagram in mm -hmm. on your website and I told him I was like I mean I'm posting what I shoot and he's like I know but the issue is let's say if you don't want to shoot church right. weddings anymore but you keep posting church weddings in your Instagram you know on your or on your website people are gonna find you and they're gonna say oh my gosh yes let's book her because she has a wedding exactly at the same church that we you know, mm -hmm. we are going to get married, which there's nothing wrong with that. But if your goal is to become a destination photographer, then start posting more of you out there, of you traveling, of you, you know, being interested into being abroad or being in other states, you know, exploring, hiking, like, or couples hiking or couples doing like amazing, you know, or couples that you have shot like in London, in Iceland, anywhere else, you know, because that is what keeps dragging more people towards you because that's just a connector thing, you know, like I like ice cream, then therefore I'm going to go to an ice cream store, you know, it's just one and one. And Jordan told me that and I was like, oh, funny. So I went, cleaned out my website and cleaned out my Instagram and literally just start posting more of that and it worked people ask me all the time what do i do to be a destination photographer the most real thing i can tell you is what jordan told me which is go places pay up front pay out of your pocket first find some couples shoot them post come back and you're gonna mm -hmm. keep getting more the first time i went to london i didn't have a couple in london i shot a couple in london 
I got, you know, way more, I got like tons of more weddings in London yeah. after that. And I had never done a wedding in London before. I just put myself to go to London. So that is the same thing of my advice to your Instagram. Post more of what you want to get yeah. more of. So I know when I reached out to you before I started doing traveling weddings and destination weddings and elopements and all that fun stuff. Um, I know I, I had asked you a similar question and you told me something similar. Um, and I kind of, I feel like I already kind of felt like I should have been just putting my traveling stuff out there. But at the same time I was like, but look at this church wedding. It's so cute. <laughs> um, and that just doesn't work. Like you have to 100% brand to it. And that has to be like your solid, like this is what I do and this is only what I do. Mm -hmm. And exactly. once you, yeah. at least when I started getting into it, once I started posting and showing people that I did do go different places and I did travel, it was nonstop booking. Like I'm pretty sure I shot like six weddings last fall and I started last fall doing traveling weddings, but once it started, it did not stop. And it was just like, you know, people would, would call me or email me and say, Hey, can you be here in a month? Or, Hey, can you be here in a month? And I was so booked up last fall. I was like, wow, I should really control what I'm doing, but <laughs> it really does just keep going once you start it too. It, yeah. It just, it's, it's such a, a simple path to walk and I know a lot of people sometimes keeps you know they keep breaking their heads and just trying to figure out and I mean because I was doing that I I have been shooting weddings you know for about like seven years now and for from the seven years only four I have been able to like be a destination like photographer for that but like I remember that was my goal since the very beginning and I spent I saw like three years just trying to understand I tried I had tried everything you know messaging people like out of nowhere like this and that I tried to offer shooting for free in exchange of the travel costs which I am guilty of that you know and that is not okay but like I, I was completely guilty of doing that because I was just trying to reach every single corner that could kind of transfer me into being a destination photographer yeah. and then I had the chance of spending some time with Jordan at a workshop and he was like do you have any questions and I had only one question how do I do this and he didn't even blink he had the answer right away because it was just so simple yeah and as soon as he told me I just felt so stupid I was like oh dang really it's like that's all that's it and he was like yes he was like and it takes time you know mm -hmm. but if you put yourself out there and you make it it's just a simple connection people will feel dragged to that because that's what they're looking for I always tell everyone it is expensive it is expensive to go places when you don't have anything booked there because you were the one paying for it, right. you know, but save money, you know, and plan, plan it well, know why you want to go there, who, and I mean, don't just get there and figure out, plan all of this way before, but just like you said, it worked for you, it worked for me, and it works, you know, you take the first steps, and slowly people will turn around and come back, and uh, just like a disclaimer like there's nothing wrong with church weddings but you can complain later that you're only getting church weddings if all you post is only church weddings you know because yeah. people will tell that all the time it's like dang it like I love them and I think they are so beautiful but I wish I was getting more destination I was like okay so you can complain so if you want to you know post them you will probably get them you know so you got to figure out a way of just not complaining so if the best way of not complaining is just not posting them so you can get more of the other side of that then that's your way yeah and it does work I mean it worked for me it worked for you it worked for like literally every person that does this yeah <laughs> so exactly. yeah I mean that's really all you have to do and I think it's just kind of jumping off 
that ledge and getting into that and Mm -hmm. just saying, Hey, I'm going to do this from now on. And this is, you know, what I do and just not accepting, um, regular weddings. Or I know even last year when I was switching into travel, uh, traveling, I did have like a regular wedding, but I didn't post it on my Instagram because Mm -hmm. it wasn't what I was branded for now, you know? So it's not on my website. It's not on my Instagram you know, sure, I'm going to uphold my agreement that I made previously, but I don't want to advertise that and get more of them too. Exactly. And it doesn't mean that, you know, the quality of our services will ever change. Right. It, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where we're shooting. It can be shooting in our, in front of our house. You know, the quality will be as great as being abroad shooting something. It's just, uh, what do you want to get more of in the end of the day and filtering? I mean, it, it's literally filtering, you know, and clients understand that because, you know, clients like some people will say, okay, have you shot at this church before? And I uh, have, I stopped taking church weddings, but like, I remember when I did back then, they would ask me if I had shot at that church before. Mm-hmm. And I would tell no, I haven't. And sometimes they wouldn't book me just because, I hadn't shot at that church before, which is just so silly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that is basically like the same thing with weddings. You kind of get filtered through, you know, like when people look through Instagram and they realize, oh, she travels for weddings. But it's easy for people to put on top of their Instagram destination weddings. Right. And then when you scroll through their feed, all they have is their hometown. Like clients will see that, (laughs) you know, because like my clients will look at my on my uh, Instagram or my website, they don't have to message me and say, have you ever done a wedding abroad? Right. You know, because they can see that. Yeah. So all I have to say is make sure that you can deliver what you're promising as your title. Because just like we have been talking for like 15 minutes, that traveling is not easy. You're going to have to figure out a lot of things. So if you have never been abroad and someone hires you to shoot abroad, I'm not saying don't take it. I'm saying take it, take it for sure. But make an effort to get there way ahead of the wedding so you can get used to everything that's around you. Because if you're not used or you have never been to that place or you have never been abroad ever, you know, you will be encountering some issues because it's not just as straightforward as renting a car in the next state inside America, you know, it's way more difficult than that. So make sure that you can deliver what you're promising to your clients as a destination photographer as well. Yep. I absolutely agree with that. And I feel like we could literally talk about this forever, Um, (laughs) but um, we're going to go ahead and let's actually ask some questions about yourself just so we can get to know you a little bit better. Cats or dogs? Ooh, I am an animal lover in general, but I have two dogs, so I'm going to go with dogs. Okay, sounds good. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Ooh, that is the most random thing, but it is grape ice cream. And we don't have it in America, but in Brazil, grape ice cream is everywhere. Not as in popsicle, like real ice cream. It's my favorite. (laughs) Okay, yeah, I haven't heard of that, but that does sound good. All right, what is your favorite place you've traveled? Mm, I think my favorite place... uh, Um, I don't know. I have been to 21, um, countries, but my favorite place still is Iceland. I just love how empty and how it hasn't been fully discovered yet. I just love that about it. It, It's forever my favorite place. Oh, I'm glad it's still your favorite after that horror story. (laughs) Oh, yeah, no, nothing, no horror story in this industry can change my love for like places. I love it. It's fine. (laughs) They're just more experiences. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) All right. So what is your on your bucket list for where you want to travel? I would love uh, um, to go to Morocco. I would love to be able to shoot a wedding in Morocco. Um, I am heading there uh, this year just for myself because I feel like it's such a, a difficult place to navigate from what 
I can see from the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would love to just go see for myself, you know, just see how do you move around here? How do you get from point A to point B? You know, how difficult is it to get places so I can offer a better experience for whenever the chance comes and my clients hire me. So I feel like Morocco is going to be my my next big place or Japan. I would say Japan as well. Okay. I love that. I love that. And yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, traveling before you end up booking clients, even if you're like, you know, years in like you are, it's just, it's the same formula, guys. You just travel, oh, yeah. you know, you take pictures and then you end up booking it. So I'm sure you'll get a Morocco wedding here soon too. Yay. Let's hope for it. Yes. <laughs> so I know that um, obviously people will want to check out your work and, and know more about you. And I know you actually have some few other brands as well. So where can we find you at? Ooh. So you can find me mainly on my uh, photography Instagram, which is just my name. It is Victoria Bonvicini. And that is the same for my website, uh, Victoria Bonvicini. And I do have uh, um, just a fun, like, uh, online store that I love. It's just for like home goods. I love making and creating things. And that is called adelaidesfort.com and yeah you probably can find me mainly on my uh wedding uh in photography instagram but you can catch me sometimes also on the other side of the business of being uh a creative person and just sewing and screen printing a bunch of stuff (laughs) yeah that sounds so fun and for anyone listening as well her links will be on my website so that you guys can go directly to that so All in all, thank you so much, Victoria, for coming on today and talking about traveling and how it can be a little bit crazy sometimes and just giving us advice and talking about experiences so that we actually know what to expect so it's not just the perfect Instagram travel life. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening. It was such an honor. I am so glad we got to talk about this. And if you guys happen to have any questions, just hit me up on Instagram and we can chat. Yeah. She was amazing at answering my question while I was getting into this and coming on today. So thank you again for coming on. And of course, thank you guys for listening. Like we said before, traveling isn't always rainbows and unicorns. So it's best to prepare yourself for the worst and enjoy the best. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to The Mentor Project with Nicole Bruce. Tune in next time for more on marketing, SEO, and going full-time as a creative.